Welcome to the RSL Victoria's Virtual VP Day Commemoration. Victory in the Pacific Day, also known as VP Day, is commemorated across Australia and the world as the anniversary of the end of World War II. It's a date that we will never forget. On the 15th of August 1945, Japan accepted the Allied Nations' terms of surrender. Australia's Prime Minister Ben Chifley announced that the war was over. On the 15th of August 2020, Australia commemorates the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. In Victoria, due to COVID-19 restrictions, this occasion won't be marked with the traditional service at the Melbourne Shrine of Remembrance. There will be no gatherings at local war memorials, RSL sub-branches, and for many of us, we will mark the occasion alone, but united by the Anzac spirit and our solemn commitment to remembrance. RSL Victoria has produced this broadcast in the spirit of remembrance. We hope that you will take this opportunity to reminisce, start conversations, and even educate others in our community. For me, on VP Day, I will be thinking of my parents who both served during World War II and all of the World War II veterans that I've had the immense privilege of meeting and knowing and even calling friends over my nearly 50 years of RSL membership. Lest we forget. We will now hear a number of veterans' stories. George Raphael, Royal Australian Navy. George was born in Brunswick in 1926. On leaving school at 15, he worked for Victoria Railways, a protected job, meaning you couldn't enlist or be conscripted. On turning 17, George tried to join the Navy. Their enlistment age was 17, a year younger than the Army or RAAF. George had to resign from Victoria Railways and was drafted to HMAS Cerberus for new entry training. Normally, recruit squads were made up of people from the same state. George was in a mixed squad of blokes from all over Australia, where his two best mates were South Australian and West Australian. On completion of this course, George was recommended for officer training school, which he completed in March 1944. As George only turned 18 a week before the course finished and all available commissions being filled, George was posted to HMAS Norman, N-Class Destroyer, to gain further experience in the fleet. HMAS Norman was attached to the British Pacific Fleet and saw action at Manus, Leyte Gulf in the Philippines and support to the US assault in Okinawa. In June 1945, George returned to HMAS Cerberus to attend an advanced anti-aircraft gun course, during which time the war ended. Drafted to HMAS Gascoigne in December 1945, George was demobilised in April 1946 at HMAS Lonsdale. On returning to Civvy Street, George started a commercial arts course at RMIT under the Government Rehabilitation Scheme. After two of the three required years, George married and founded a paid job with the State Electricity Commission as an adult clerk. He stayed with the State Electricity Commission until retirement, holding a number of positions, including Industrial Relations Manager. Keith Hearn, 2nd AIF. Keith was born in Bairnsdale, Victoria in 1925 and worked on the family farm until he left school. He enlisted in the army at Ripponlea in August 1943 and went to Warwick, Queensland to do his infantry training. He remembers learning to fall out the back of a blitz wagon until four of his mates were injured and they put a stop to that. After recovering from appendicitis surgery, he was sent to Canungra Jungle Training Centre in Queensland in January 1944. Keith was posted to the 2nd 31st Infantry Battalion, whose motto is Forever Forward, and landed on Ballackpapin with the 7th Division, where he fought for a number of months before being wounded in the wrist by a hand grenade in July 1945. He was evacuated to a US hospital ship, where the surgeon advised him he was lucky, as his wound was a ticket home. Keith said to him, you don't know the Australian Army, mate and he was posted to Moritai Island and put in charge of barge moving stores while awaiting further surgery. Keith was demobilised in January 1946 at Camp Pell and went into butchering. He owned several of his own shops and boning businesses. 
He and Wally Robertson are the only two surviving members of the second 31st. Keith has been a long-time member of the RSL and served as a divisional representative for Gippsland and a member of the state executive for many years. He loved his work at Anzac House and said the girls are just fantastic. In 2015, Keith was a guest of the Sultan of Brunei for the anniversary of the 70th liberation of that country. Shirley Gregory, Women's Auxiliary, Australian Air Force. Shirley was born in Menangatang in 1926. The family then moved to Bendigo, where she went to school at St Mary's Convent, completing her year 12. On leaving school, Shirley went to work for Victorian Railways as a stenographer. In 1944, aged 18, she joined the WAF and completed her basic training at Preston Depot. She then joined the Clark General Draft for further training. Her first posting as aircraft's woman was to the RAAF base in Cressy, one of many Air Force bases scattered around Australia during World War II. Shirley recalls it being a bit boring, being out in the middle of rural Victoria with little entertainment. In 1945, Shirley married Frank Gregory, a wireless air gunner who was in Melbourne recovering from a wound. Frank was later posted as an instructor to South Australia. When Shirley was posted to Melbourne Records Office, she made a couple of great friends, Margaret and Reen, and they stayed in touch for many years after the war, despite them living in Mildura and Adelaide respectively. Shirley was demobilised in early 1946. She and Frank lived around the Hampton area, where she raised three children as a stay-at-home mum. Harold Ristrom, Royal Australian Navy. Harold George Ristrom was born in Benalla on the 21st of June 1924, the oldest of five children. His family moved several times during the Great Depression in pursuit of work and eventually settled in Bentley in Melbourne's southeast. He was 15 years old, working as a newspaper boy when World War II broke out in 1939. When he finished school, he got a job as a junior clerk for the Royal Insurance Company in Collins Street. Inspired by his great-grandfather, who was a sailor on merchant vessels, Harold had a hankering for the sea. So, one lunchtime, not far from where he worked, he went to the older fleet building and volunteered for the Navy. He was sworn in, but turned away, told to go home, work and come back when he's wanted. As the weeks went by, Harold eagerly awaited news from the Navy. Then, on his 18th birthday, he received a letter from the Army. Despite pleading his case that he'd signed up with the Navy, the Army had other plans. After completing eight weeks training at Pakapunyal with the 4th Field Training Regiment, Harold approached his staff sergeant to volunteer for the Australian Imperial Force in the hope of travelling abroad like his uncle George, who had been a volunteer soldier for artillery and was sent to Syria and the Middle East. The story goes that it was only then that the sergeant remembered a letter he'd received from the Navy concerning Harold. As a result, on the 27th of August 1942, the Army discharged Harold and he transferred to HMAS Cerberus, where he entered into the Royal Australian Naval Reserve as ordinary seaman. Harold was assigned to Special Services Combined Operations. During his time in the Navy, Harold became known as Hiram, a character he impersonated from a children's radio program, Frank and Archie. In October 1943, Harold was drafted to HMAS Canimbla as coxswain of landing craft, vehicle and personnel K-12. He spent the rest of the year engaged in training with US troops in amphibious warfare near the Naval Beach Commando School in Queensland in preparation for operations. From January 1944 until the end of World War II, Canimbla participated in seven operations in the Southwest Pacific. One of the symbolic moments Hiram was involved with was the landing squadron that returned General Douglas MacArthur to the Philippines. Victory in the Pacific was declared on the 15th of August 1945, marking the end of World War II. Harold remembers it was late at night when the news came through on the Canimbla, but it was business as usual. One of Hiram's proudest memories of his service with the Canimbla was repatriating long-serving Australian servicemen from the Pacific Islands. He says it was a privilege to bring those troops home to a tumultuous welcome in September 1945. 
After being discharged from the Navy in July 1946, he rejoined the Royal Insurance Company until 1950, when he joined the Caledonian Insurance Company, where he worked until he retired. Hiram often thinks about his best mates he transferred to the Navy with, a friendship that spanned more than 70 years. Hiram has two children, six grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. He has remained connected to the RSL throughout the years and has been actively engaged in all things naval. I now invite the Governor, the Honourable Linda Dassault AC, to present an address to all Victorians. First, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which I'm standing and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Well, Wednesday the 15th of August 1945, saw a grey and chilly winter's day dawning in Melbourne. That morning, Victorians, whether at home or at work, were waiting, waiting and hoping to learn of the Japanese surrender in the Pacific. In the event, it came a little earlier than anticipated, when at 9.30 a.m. Prime Minister Chifley made the announcement, fellow citizens, the war is over. Many of us today have no direct recollection of that morning, nor of the hard years that had preceded it. No direct recollection of the deep sadness that had rippled through communities, with loved ones lost, injured or held as prisoners of war. No recollection of the fear with battles on our doorstep and enemy bombings on our home soil. Nor of the sacrifices, including by those at home. Many of us can only imagine the emotions of that August morning elation that the war was finally ending, but enduring heartache for the heavy cost. Three quarters of a century has now passed, but the significance of the 15th of August 1945 still resonates with us. We're still in awe of the courage of those who served, and we still grieve for those who did not return or who've carried the heavy burden of their injury or imprisonment. And we certainly appreciate what they fought for, the ideals and the protections. Across the decades, of course, much has changed, but our values have not. This difficult year has shown us that in the sharpest possible focus. Our Australian Defence Force has, in a different context, modelled what grit, commitment, care and service look like as they've stepped up here at home in the bushfires and in the pandemic wherever and however they've been asked to serve. And when we see them in action here, we know that the values that their forebears fought for are certainly not consigned to history. And we know that when we look to the most important group amongst us on this anniversary. Although naturally it's a source of disappointment that we can't gather together today, we feel a particular sadness that we can't be with that now small group of courageous men and women who, unlike the many of us, were indeed a part of what we reflect upon. Those who served in World War II, who sacrificed for us. My last words today are reserved specifically for you. We thank you. We hope you feel proud of what you've done for us. And we hope that in turn, in our values and in our actions, we can make you feel proud of us. And please know that we have learned from your example and that we will remember. I now invite the State Minister for Veterans, the Honourable Sean Lean, to say a few words. My mum said when my dad joined the 2nd 5th Commando Squadron, he weighed 11 stone. And when he returned from World War II, he was lucky to be eight stone ringing wet. Dad went off to World War II with his best mate. His best mate didn't make it home. My dad was haunted by his mate's death and his own experiences in New Guinea and Borneo. Upon his return, he managed to put his work effort, love and commitment to his family to the front of his mind. He very rarely spoke of his experience of the war apart from some things that amused him, like the one about his short commando mates who claimed they served the ferret squad. He also acquired an absolute hatred for bugs, so we spent our childhood covered in repellent. As for my mother, the recognition of what he had sacrificed was so important. And that's why I am so proud today to recognise the immense service 
of all those who served in World War II. A conflict that claimed 39,000 Australian lives and injured or wounded thousands of servicemen and women. This day in 1945 marks the end of five years, 11 months and 11 days of Australian hardship, hard work and sacrifice. And it was ultimately a day of great relief, joy and hope for the future. Today, as some of us mark this anniversary from our home, we once again find ourselves banding together to face a global threat. So let's look to the stories of our World War II heroes, thank them for their service and draw upon their immense bravery, resilience and spirit of mateship, lest we forget. The Governor and Mr Howard will now lay a wreath on behalf of all Victorians. Major General Andrew Bottrell, CSC, and Mr Daniel Costello will now lay a wreath on behalf of the Australian Defence Force. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
lest we forget.
again And Jimmy will go to sleep In his own little room again There'll be bluebirds over The white cliffs of Dover Tomorrow, just you wait and see. The shepherd will tend his sheep, the valley will bloom again, and Jimmy will go to sleep. Again, there'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover tomorrow. Just you wait. We will now hear a number of veterans' stories. William Murray Weston, RAAF. Murray was born in the Royal Women's Hospital in 1920 and grew up in Essendon, even though he barracked for Collingwood, unlike the rest of his family. He enlisted in 1940, and with such a high number of volunteers at the time, they were being sworn in three at a time. Murray was sworn in with Hubert Opperman, the famous bike rider who later became a politician and ambassador to Malta. After recruit training at Laverton, Murray was posted to 14th Repair and Salvage Unit and served in various Australian posts, including in Darwin and Moratai. The day he landed, Murray was settling in for the night in the canteen and his brother walked in without knowing he was there. A very happy reunion. In May 1945, three days before war's end, his eldest brother was shot down and killed in Europe. Murray has many wonderful stories. He recalls a time at Laverton when he was on guard at the front gate. Wing Commander Cummings snuck in the back gate. So the guard commander told him to keep his eyes peeled and to call out the guard when he saw him approaching. As he had already been on the base, on leaving, Wing Commander Cummings slowly drove past and shouted, Wing Commander Cummings! Murray shouted back, Thanks mate, I'll keep an eye out for the bugger. The guard commander wasn't too happy when the boss rang and explained what happened. At war's end, Murray signed on to stay with the RAAF and served for a further 23 years, mostly at Point Cook and Laverton. Murray married Dorothy in 1950, they had a son and two daughters and enjoyed 70 years together. Francis Frank Sims, RAAF Frank was born in Carlton in 1924 and lived in Abbotsford area during his school years. After resigning from the State Electricity Commission, he joined the RAAF at Russell Street Police Station Recruiting Office. Following basic training at Wagga, Frank went to Canada as part of the Australian Empire Air Training Scheme. Over 30,000 Australians trained under the scheme. Training as a navigator bomb aimer, Frank graduated and was posted to a Sunderland Flying Boat Squadron, Royal Air Force, in Scotland, part of Coastal Command for a time, flying anti-submarine patrol. In late 1943, Frank was selected for commissioning and attended the 4th Officer Training Unit in Scotland and was commissioned as a pilot officer after graduating. Frank was posted back to Sunderland flying boats and was detached to a mixture of aircraft types working with Special Operations Executive working directly for Whitehall. This took the crew to many and varied places and tasks, serving in the UK, Middle East and Mediterranean in a mixed crew of all nationalities. Frank was demobilised in January 1946 at the Royal Exhibition Building and he returned to the State Electricity Commission at his previous job as a clerk, now adult clerk, as he was over 21. In 1947, he married Marge and settled in East Brighton. Frank and Marge were very fortunate as two sisters, the Plunkett sisters, who owned one of the market gardens in the area, offered ex-service personnel blocks of land for a tenth of the real cost. 
The hard part at that time was getting the building materials for the house. As Frank served in RAF units during the war, he joined the Odd Bods Association, made up of RAAF service people who served in different countries' units. Frank enjoyed marching on Anzac Day and looked forward to catching up with fellow Odd Bods. John Hook, 2nd AIF John Hook was born on the 20th of October 1925 in the United Kingdom and came to Australia with his parents a year later. With no intention of going to university, he finished Year 11 at Melbourne Boys High School in 1941 and got a job at the Commonwealth Bank as a junior clerk. But a strong sense of duty to his country led him to enlist with the Army in January 1944. Breaking the news to his mother is his strongest memory of the time, saying she was horrified that he'd volunteered his service. He completed his infantry training at Cowra and was eventually deployed to Leh, Papua New Guinea and then to the War Crimes Commission in Rabaul, New Britain, where he worked as an interpreter as part of the Allied Translator and Interpreter Service, having already learnt Japanese. It was his job to read the verdict to the Japanese officers, the majority who were eventually executed for war crimes at Rabaul, an experience he describes as fairly traumatic. One of the major trials he was involved in included the officers responsible for the deaths of Australian prisoners of war during the well-known Sandakan death marches in Borneo. He tells stories about his encounters with the likes of General Imamura, who was the senior Japanese general in the Southwest Pacific during World War II, and Lieutenant Hideo Katayama from the Imperial Japanese Navy, both accused of war crimes. John's grateful for the friendships he made during his service years, continuing to share his life and experiences with fellow service members of the RSL for decades after the war finished. After discharging in 1947, John gratefully but unexpectedly went to study commerce at Melbourne University under the Commonwealth Rehabilitation Training Scheme. It gave him the opportunity to have a stable career for many years thereafter, working for Shell, Repco and eventually as a university lecturer. He was married to Mary for 62 years, they had four children, ten grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. After divine service, the Queen attends a solemn dedication ceremony at Melbourne's War Memorial, a shrine of remembrance. Her Majesty is escorted by Lieutenant General Sir Edmund Herring, Chairman of the Shrine Trustees. The Queen, in her dedication speech, reminds us of the sacrifices made in war. To the glory of God and in grateful memory of the men and women of this state who served in the Second World War, I dedicate this forecourt and set alight the flame in honour of all those who died for us. Let us ever be mindful that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Her Majesty presses a button which lights a symbolic flame in a brazier in the open forecourt. This flame, which will never be extinguished, is an everlasting memorial to the illustrious dead. Huge and reverent crowds join with the Queen in this simple but deeply impressive ceremony. Please continue watching as we have more veteran stories to tell. Phoebe Parker, Australian Women's Army Service. 
Born in County Durham, England in 1919, Phoebe sailed to Australia with her family in 1924, a trip that took six weeks. Settling in Malvern, she went to Taronga Road Central School. In early 1942, Phoebe joined the Australian Women's Army Service. As a private, she attended Ivanhoe Grammar School, then operating as a signal school and qualified in Morse code, wireless transmission and telephony. Posted to Albert Park Drill Hall, she met Graham, her husband-to-be. Phoebe married Graham in 1943. They went AWOL for a week. This didn't go down well with the powers that be, and Phoebe was quickly transferred to PACOR in the CBD. Demobilised in December 1945, Phoebe and Graham settled in Pascovale, where she took on home duties and raised two daughters. A long-time RSL member, Phoebe misses catching up with her friends, but said we just have to do the right thing and get on top of this bug. Andrew Bishop, 2nd AIF. Andrew Bishop was born in England on the 9th of April 1924. Living through the Great Depression, the son of a Mali settler was sent off to work at the age of 13. Underage at just 16, he enlisted with the army at the Melbourne Town Hall on the 11th of July 1940, motivated by the apparent good pay and three meals a day. After completing his basic training in Balcom, he transferred to 2nd 22nd Battalion at Treywool. His section was posted to Rabaul, New Britain in early 1941 and shifted to Vulcan Beach, Simpson Harbour in January 1942. In the early hours of the 23rd of January 1942, Andrew heard the first noises of the Japanese landing. With their motors off, they could be seen paddling their barges onto the beach. After hours of gunfire, daybreak came and they were instructed to get out. With no plans in place for a withdrawal, it was each man for himself. And so began three harrowing months, which saw Andrew and a group of mates fight for their lives, facing repeated enemy attacks, illnesses and war wounds. Andrew eventually arrived back in Cairns in April 1942, wearing the same clothes he'd been wearing for the last three months. Suffering from starvation and malaria, Andrew was in bad shape. A good meal and a shower later, he was put on a train to Brisbane and then sent to Melbourne on leave. Not home for even a day, Andrew became so ill his father called for an ambulance. He was taken to Heidelberg Repatriation Hospital and then to recuperate in an army hospital near Ballarat. He transferred to B Company 2nd 2nd Battalion and was posted to New Guinea where he was a machine gunner. Wounded during an invasion, he was unable to return to the front line, suffering from bullet fragments in one of his lungs. Instead of returning to Australia, Andrew elected to transfer to Water Transport 55 landing craft based at Robal Harbour. He discharged in 1946 and moved to Western New South Wales, where he worked as a boundary rider and sinking dams at Boondara. At the time, he enjoyed the solitude as he readjusted back to civvy life. After moving around a number of times and employed in various jobs, Andrew finally settled in Cheltenham in Melbourne's southeast in the early 60s. Andrew has special memories of the mates he served with. They were like family to him. He has five surviving children, over 20 grandchildren, more than 40 great-grandchildren, and now even has great-great-grandchildren. Robert Bob Javons, Royal Australian Navy. Bob was born in South Melbourne on the 2nd of December 1926 and went to school and lived around the Elstonwick Brighton area for most of his life. He enlisted in the Navy in April 1944 at HMAS Lonsdale. As a 17-year-old, his mum wasn't too happy, as his dad, Lieutenant Commander, and older brother, a midshipman, were both in the Navy in minesweepers. Bob did his entry-level training at HMA Cerberus, followed by a gunnery training course in both anti-aircraft and four-inch guns. On completion of this course, he was drafted to Newcastle and was part of the commissioning crew of HMA's Condamine built in Newcastle, a river-class frigate. Bob has special memories of 12 mates, all from Melbourne, who trained together and served on Condamine from the get-go. HMAS Condamine served in the Southwest Pacific and Islands North until war's end. 
Bob was demobilised at Camp Pell in Royal Park, set up by the US Army, and took a year off to spend relaxing around Brighton Baths. Eventually, he got a job with International Chemical Industries as a marketing manager of raw materials. Bob married Gladys in 1950 and had three children, ten grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. He joined Caulfield RSL with his dad at War's End and is a current member of the Hampton RSL. Jessie Flanders, Women's Royal Australian Navy Jessie Flanders was born in 1922 on her parents' farm in Western Victoria. When she moved to Melbourne with her sister, they both took work in clerical roles for the Shell Company. Upon joining the Women's Royal Australian Navy in 1941, Jessie was posted to Monterey in Queens Road, St Kilda, which served as an outpost of Bletchley Park, a secret communications code-breaking organisation. By intercepting and breaking the code of Japanese wartime communications, Jessie was part of a team that saved many Allied lives and provided critical intelligence that assisted in the ability of the Allied forces to defend Australia. Never allowed to talk about her role in the war, Jessie didn't receive recognition until many decades later when presented with a pin by British Prime Minister David Cameron, thanking her for her vital work. After the war, Jessie returned to the farm and married a former fighter pilot, Bob Patterson, with whom she had three children. Upon Bob's passing in 1975, Jessie moved to Casterton, where she married John Flanders. John passed away in 2000. Jessie still lives in Casterton, is an avid member of the Casterton RSL sub-branch and has a strong involvement at the Australian Kelpie Centre over many years. Alan Moore, Army Alan Moore was born in 1920 and grew up in Camberwell in Melbourne's Inner East. He attended Camberwell Grammar and Melbourne Grammar and joined the Melbourne Grammar Cadets and achieved the rank of Lieutenant. When the war started, Alan wanted to join the Australian Imperial Force. However, he was still under 21 and his parents wouldn't sign permission. He sat for the first appointment qualification and was appointed as a Lieutenant in 14th Militia Battalion in 1939. In 1940, the militia called for volunteers for tropical service and Alan was selected and joined the famous 39th Battalion and sailed to Papua New Guinea. Alan served in both B and D Company 39th during the Kokoda and San Ananda campaign. On the disbanding of the 39th Battalion, Alan transferred to the 2nd 6th Battalion AIF and fought in the WIWAC campaign. Alan discharged with the rank of captain in December 1945. He married a young widow, Joan Fawcett, and they moved to Mount Eliza, where they had two daughters. Alan worked for Heinz as manager of their baby food division until retirement in 1980. Alan was Commodore of the Canadian Bay Sailing Club for several years and had a keen interest in Rotary and Probus. A member of the Mornington RSL sub-branch, Alan will celebrate his 100th birthday in November this year. John Bell, RAAF. John Bell, known as Jack to his mates, was born on the 20th of December 1917 to parents Bert and Carrie Bell in Tawong, an inner suburb of Brisbane. Jack attended Tawong State School and later Brisbane Boys College, where he passed his junior public certificate. After finishing school, Jack started work at D&W Murray Limited, a men's and boys clothing warehouse on Elizabeth Street in Brisbane. After joining the militia at aged 18 and becoming a member of the Royal Australian Artillery, Jack later enlisted in the Royal Australian Air Force in May 1940. After undertaking training as a wireless operator and air gunner, Jack embarked for Egypt, arriving in March 1941. He joined No. 216 Squadron Royal Air Force in August 1941. On the 23rd of January 1942, Jack was shot down in Libya. His best friend, Tony Carter, was killed in the crash and Jack was severely wounded. He credits his survival to the skills of those who operated on him in the German field hospital in Antalat. Jack spent five months in hospitals in Libya and Italy. During his time as a prisoner of war, Jack was transferred to several different camps, including PG-57 in northern Italy and Stalag 14B in Germany. Thinking about his time as a POW, Jack remembers a lack of food as a huge issue. 
His diet consisted of pickled vegetables, horse meat, sauerkraut, millet, sugar beets and bread made from bruised rye, beet fibre, sawdust or wood flour and edible grasses and leaves. Jack remembers eating his first piece of white bread when he was liberated. He remembers it tasted like cake, just beautiful. Following his liberation, Jack returned to England in May 1945, where he had a whale of a time spending his back pay with his mates. Returning to civilian life in Australia, Jack and his wife Dolores had one daughter, Sandy, and have three granddaughters. Jack's early working life served him well, returning to work in the textiles industry until his retirement. Jack is a member of the Camberwell RSL sub-branch and the Ex-Prisoners of War and Relatives Association, the Odd Bods UK Association and the Air Force Association. Jack is 102.